Many of the activities we engage in will have profound effects on future generations. For example, government spending on education, on the welfare state. These will all have implications on the next generation to be born. In addition to this, however, we have a new set of problems. The prospect of dangerous climate change and with the use of nuclear energy, we can affect future generations for hundreds, indeed thousands of years. These intergenerational phenomena raise two kinds of questions. First, they raise ethical questions. What is it that we owe future generations? What obligations do we have to them? Second, they ask questions about our existing political institutions. They ask us to think about ways in which they might be reformed so that we can offer due protection to the interests of future generations. Let's consider the ethical question first. What is it that we owe future generations? One answer, and it's found in the Brundtland Commission's report, Our Common Future, is that we owe future generations to leave the world so that their basic needs are met. This seems along the right line, but it does also seem rather weak. It would, for example, allow the current generation to use up all of the Earth's resources and have an amazingly high standard of living just as long as we live future generations enough to scrape by and meet their basic needs. And that doesn't seem fair. Why should they have much worse prospects than us just because they're born later in time? Others, such as the political thinker Brian Barry, have said that current generations have an obligation to leave future generations a world just as good as the one that we inherited. It can be better off, we can leave them better off, but we must leave them no worse off than our world. But this raises a further question, no worse off in terms of what? For example, should we think of fair shares in terms of happiness and well-being? Or should we think of it in monetary terms like wealth and income? What answer we give to this question will have major implications for many of our policies, including, for example, our attitude towards economic growth. If, for example, we think that intergenerational justice requires leaving opportunities for good and fulfilling lives to future generations, then this might lead us to rethink our current focus on economic growth. This is certainly the view taken by some famous thinkers of the past. For example, John Stuart Mill in Principles of Political Economy defends the ideal of a stationary state. And he argues that we should focus more on happiness and the art of living and less on the art of getting on. We find a similar theme in the work of John Maynard Keynes, the great economist. In Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, he says, like Mill, that once we attain a certain material standard of living, our focus should be on the art of life and less on the means of life. Taking intergenerational justice seriously also raises questions about existing political institutions. At the moment, these are resolutely focused on the short term. This is in part because of human nature, but it's also partly a function of our political systems. In democracies, we have the electoral cycle, and governments will naturally seek to win re-election by promising short-term gains over the long term. How do we rethink political institutions to give adequate protection to future generations? We can think of at least two kinds of response. One of these is more constitutional and legal in nature. It focuses on ways of disempowering current generations, using codified constitutions, courts and ombudsmen, to prevent current generations from enacting policies which harm future people. Another way is more political and legislative. It focuses on the parliamentary procedure and it tries to design the policy-making process to give due concern to future generations. It puts their concerns at the heart of policy-making. One step in this direction was taken by Finland, which in 1993 created a select committee for the future. Drawing on this, we might think of revising and reforming British political institutions. Imagine, for example, a system in which a newly elected government was required to give a mandate for Britain in 50 years' time or 100 years' time. 
and imagine that that mandate was assessed by a select committee for the future and that government ministers and leading politicians were required to stand up in public and justify their policies in terms of how they were leaving the world for those who come after us. Such a process may not guarantee that the interests of future generations are adequately secured. Nothing may guarantee that, but what it will do is make it very hard for politicians to ignore the future and to set them aside and focus on just the here and now. The central point is that if, as many accept, we have obligations to those who come after us, then we need to think about how we can redesign our political structure so as best to reflect those obligations, and soon, before it's too late.